Uh, members, now we will move to item nine. We have Jacques and Dawn, Claire and Matthew. Kia ora everyone. Um, we have the draft Tamaki Makoto Future Development Strategy, approval for consultation. Um, if you want to take us through, introduce yourselves and your roles as you go, and we'll um, go through the presentation, and then we'll have questions straight after the presentation. Thank you. Kia um, I am Jacques Victor. I am the General Manager of <coughs> Auckland Strategy and Research. And Dawn and Claire will introduce themselves. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, Dawn Mackay, and I am the Manager of Growth and Spatial Strategy. Kia ora koutou. Ko Claire Gray toko I am a Principal Advisor in the Growth and Spatial Strategy team. Thank you, Chair. Um, the item in front of you uh, today is to adopt the draft future development strategy for public consultation. Um, <clears throat> we will essentially take the, both the report and the actual strategy itself as read. Um, the report sets out all of the, um, the key elements of the strategy, so that's all set out for you there. Um, however, we will just really quickly um, run you through some of the key elements of the strategy, um, and then we'll move on to questions. Which button? Uh, so we'll basically, um, just in terms of the key elements, we'll group it around those three um, points. Just before we get into that, I just want to point out some really minor changes. We sent you a, um, a document on Thursday or Friday, I forget now, um, and they asked three really minor changes from that version that you had to the one that is in the agenda. Um, some minor changes to the spatial priorities map figure 18. That is really, we fixed some of the hatching on the document. Um, we edited Appendix 6 where we removed some repetition and that repetition is um, stuff that was, uh, still is within Appendix 8, so just not to keep on repeating stuff. And we added um, legends to uh, the maps in Appendix 8. They didn't have legends and they now do. Those were the only changes and nothing changed in the text, um, so the two versions are exactly the same. And just before we get to those main things, I'm just quickly going to um, remind you that the future development strategy is done under the National Policy Statement Urban Development, so that is an RMA instrument. Um, and what the NPS requires the strategy to do um, is to form the basis for our strategic long-term planning. What that means is that it must also inform the long-term plan, so the LTP. So the basis that informs the LTP. Um, in terms of the NPS, it has to achieve um, the concept that you will be very well aware of, of well-functioning urban environments. Um, it has to ensure that we have sufficient development capacity, um, and it needs to bring together that integration of land use and um, infrastructure. So both the planning and the funding of infrastructure. And just a little bit quickly on the context in which this one was done. Um, so the, the projected population growth for Auckland is around 520,000 people over the next 30 years, um, which brings us to just over 2.2 million. 
in terms of um, housing demand and capacity, in terms of the demand, that translates to around 200,000 additional dwellings over 30 years. And that's around a 34% growth in our housing numbers. Um, and to note that at the moment, so in terms of the plan change 78 capacity modeling, um, we have just over 2.3 million dwelling capacity. So have a capacity of just over 2.3 million, and what we require is around 200,000 over the 30 years. In terms of business demand and capacity, <coughs> and that population growth um, translates to around 280,000 additional um, jobs required. That's around a 30% growth. Um, in terms of the um, initial assessment, so that's the housing and business assessment, um, it shows that we have sufficient enabled business capacity at a regional basis. There may possibly be, um, in the short and medium term, some shortfalls in sub-regions um, and in particular sectors. And the slide there should say, uh, example of those sectors being land extensive, not land intensive. That's my mistake. So it's particularly in those land extensive um, sectors where there might in the short, medium term be some shortfalls. But in terms of the medium to long term, we know that there um, is more business land um, coming on stream, especially in the south and the northwest. So that should address that issue. Um, I am going to hand over to, to Claire, just take you through some of those high, uh, key elements. Thanks, Jacques. So I'll just talk through um, four of the key aspects in the draft strategy that we've particularly focused on to strengthen. Um, the first one is the quality compact approach, which has been a central part of um, Auckland's planning approach since 2012 with the first Auckland plan. Um, but with this strategy, we have looked at it again, particularly in light of new legislative requirements and new information. So um, there's the well-functioning urban environment term again. So this um, approach, the quality compact approach, will be Auckland's version of a well-functioning urban environment. Um, and we've added to, so the idea is that um, local authorities can add to the minimum that's set out in the national policy statement on urban development. And that's what we're proposing to do through this strategy. Um, and that's particularly in terms of um, environmental aspects, um, hazards and addressing hazards, and the, the quality aspects. Um, so it focuses most of Auckland's future growth in the existing urban area. Um, and an important part of that is developing focal points for the sub-regions. So that's particularly, in this case, Albany, Westgate, Monaco, um, along with the city centre, um, are nodes that play a really important part in creating more sustainable sub-regions over that long term, over the 30-year period that we're looking at in this strategy. Um, so that's thinking about employment closer to homes, um, reducing the need to travel, um, and creating really strong uh, centres in those sub-regions. Um, we've also got a much greater focus on the, the quality aspects, so mixed use, um, higher density development in good locations, so close to public transport, around centres and around employment areas in the existing urban area. Um, and the other side of that is that there's less of an emphasis on the greenfield development, so areas that are, that are further out and are remote and are removed from those kind of um, amenities and employment opportunities. The second aspect that we've particularly looked at in this strategy and strengthened is around the hapu and iwi values and aspirations for urban development. Um, so there is a draft statement of values and aspirations um, included in the strategy, and there are two main parts to that. I suppose there's the, there's the um, statement itself, but there's also how the statement has informed the rest of the strategy. 
Um, so the statement itself was developed through engagement with iwi, specifically in relation to the future development strategy, um, but also by looking at uh, previous feedback from other engagement that the council has done, um, particularly looking at Te Tāru Kia Tāwhiri, so feedback on Te Tāru Kia Tāwhiri, the climate plan, the water strategy, um, thriving community strategy, for example, um, and also looking at iwi management plans and environmental plans to get an understanding of um, what's been said before and what iwi have um, told the council. Um, and one of the key themes that came through was around Modi. So in the strategy, that's um, the first spatial outcome, and it's around viewing Tamaki Makoto as an interconnected living system. So it's, it's saying that all decisions and actions will consider Modi, um, will consider the interrelationships and interconnections um, of different systems, and that will all be looked at holistically. Decisions in one area um, will be considered, the impacts of those will be considered on Auckland as a whole. Um, at the moment, the statement is with iwi for review um, and sign off, and we'll keep working with iwi um, on refining that statement through to the end of June, so sort of through to the end of the consultation, the formal consultation period. Um, the third area that we've looked at in particular is um, how we address natural environment outcomes. So that's particularly looking at the importance of integrating the natural and built um, environments and connecting ecosystems, and it's linked that kind of approach is linked to other key changes. Um, the next one, which I'll touch on, is the focus on climate change, but also that holistic and interconnected um, view of Auckland. So the last aspect I'd just like to touch on is um, around strengthening those climate change considerations. Um, and the approach that's taken in the draft strategy aligns with Te Tāru Kia Tāwhiri, um, with the transport emission reduction pathway with RMA amendments, with the MPSUD requirements. So there's also a strong link with the quality compact approach um, where development is focused in areas with good active and public transport options and there's less emphasis on that greenfield growth um, that's, that's more removed from rapid transit and um, major centres and, and employment uses. Um, and finally, just pointing out that the draft strategy focuses both on climate change adaptation and mitigation, so it addresses both of those at, at a strategic level. And now I'll just hand over to Dawn. Thanks, Claire. So our spatial response takes a strategic um, the strategic framework that Claire's just talked about and translates it into what that means for Auckland on the ground. So the strategy emphasises the importance of development in our existing urban areas. We already have about 80% of development happening that's um, residential happening in our urban areas, mostly through intensification. We want to, as part of... Um, Going forward with this strategy, we want to do things like strengthening the nodes, which Claire talked about, so it's Albany, Monaco, Westgate and the city centre, um, because those provide that sub-regional strength to, to the city. We also want to look at the local level and strengthen our neighbourhoods uh, and centres with a focus on improving walkability um, and how people can access jobs and community facilities. So it's those day-to-day -day needs that, that they are being satisfied within their local areas. Um, this strategy is also looking at the context where we now, you know, we are very conscious that we've got areas that some are suitable for intensification, but there's also areas where we have constraints. 
And so we're looking at work that needs to be done to identify those most constrained by hazards and where council could focus. Um, and then initial investigations into appropriate adaptive responses to support the local communities. Uh, turning to our future urban areas, um, our spatial response proposes ways that um, we develop in our future urban areas. The review that we've done as part of this work um, included factors like um, looking at natural hazards, climate change, um, the development capacity in existing urban areas as well as what was in future urban, uh, and the cost of infrastructure. We've identified four areas that we propose uh, in this draft document to delete, either in whole or part, plus a number of other areas that we propose to investigate further or redevelopment, uh, or sorry, or defer redevelopment readiness until later. Um, timing, in the existing strategy, we have uh, increments in the, in the forms, which look at five-year periods. We've changed that approach and are now looking at um, principally infrastructure triggers to uh, look at bringing areas uh, to development readiness and zoning. The planned um, sequencing framework, which is currently in the future um, urban land supply, the falls, as a separate document, will now sit solely in the updated um, future development strategy. That means that all our strategic spatial information will be brought together in one place as part of a regional context. And um, the last spatial slide is actually the one that brings things together. So it's, it's our spatial prioritisation. And this looks, uh, you know, focusing on the map. Um, we've tried to incorporate in this map a focus for the first 10 years and then look out to the longer term, the 30-year term, uh, as we're required to in the, in the NPSUD. You'll see we've provided a greater focus on, on the first 10 years, and this comes back to the certainty we have in the short term versus the uncertainty, greater uncertainty we've got in that longer term. So we've broken it into those two periods. Um, we have looked at prior prioritisation as a region-wide approach. So you'll see on the map, it's got both um, the existing urban areas and also the future urban areas. Um, in the short term, the, the priorities look at nodes. And so in this case, for, the te for the, this current 10 years, we see the city centre with finishing off the stations for the CRL, plus uh, Westgate, where we need to invest now to be able to get rapid transit into that northwest area in future as the priorities. As we move forward into the next 10, 20 years, then that prioritisation and the investment that we need in those nodes might change to another area like Monaco or, um, or Albany. It depends on the projects, but for this 10 years, we think that it's those two nodes that are the priorities for us. We're also looking at joint priorities. The, the projects that we're investing in with central government, so the ones that are highlighted on here are um, particularly Rosco and Mangri, and we've got um, Tamaki, which has been proceeding as well. So those are the ones where we've got definite areas where we're looking at where do we invest in infrastructure in the 10 years, but the, there's also an element of the large areas and those projects will get go on into the next um, 10 and 20 year periods as well. Um, and lastly, we, we look in, in terms of the strategy at local areas and communities because um, these are, the, are important in terms of those shorter term projects that might 
be staged and have uh, relevance particularly for local communities in the short term. So um, previous, you know, an example of that would be Ekipanuku and the work they do on town centre revitalisation. And an example would be of that would be Northcote and the town centre. Um, there would also be other projects that at local levels with environmental emphasis. Um, these are the priorities that we, we're proposing for the um, long-term plan for the investment. So it's just a small number of, of areas which uh, we can focus on in that 10-year period. In the longer term, as I said, there's less certainty about where we invest. And you might, you can probably just see on the on the map, there are um, corridors that are on there that that indicate some of the major projects that are coming um, in the future, uh, like the Auckland Light Rail, um, the uh, additional Waitemata Harbour crossing, and also uh, rapid transit to the northwest. Plus. The other projects like um, link, the link between Westgate and Albany and um, the airport to Botany link as well, showing the importance not just of taking people into the city centre but also making those cross-regional linkages to strengthen those, um, those areas. Can you, can you just describe where those areas are? Because you can't, I can't just, believe I'm uh, is there? I'm just wondering whether I've got a... It's just the lighter, the lighter shadowing on the... Oh, I can't read Nexus, I can't. It's just a pixel over the There are some maps that were provided as well which show the um, areas in more detail as part of the package. So I'll just see if I can find... Oh, here we go. Here's a copy of the maps, and uh, we we emailed the PDFs to everyone because of this feedback. Okay. So everyone so had. It's yeah. hard putting everything together. Yeah, but we, we have it on Nexus, and we've sent Nexus it out to everyone. Us. Yes, but we've sent it out to everyone, so it's not up to us to point out which emails. So, so you need to read the corridors that you can see on there. They're in the light green. Uh, if, so, if you have you, um, sorry, councillor, do you have your computer with you? I've got two computers. And if you just search future development strategy, you'll see the email you have in your inbox with the PDFs in there, and they're very clear. You can zoom in on them. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just talking, finishing off that conversation about the longer term, less certainty about where our priority areas might be, because those major projects which represent, do represent opportunities for Auckland in the future haven't quite landed yet. So we don't know the routes or the project sequences uh, or the, t you know, the timings. So our map at the moment shows those corridors. It shows places like um, Mount Roskill and Maungari will be pi a bit of pipeline into those projects but other um, potential um, areas where we might have as priorities are indicated by those red dots that are on the map. They are very preliminary and they're just suggestions at this point in time. It's actually very hard to indicate, uh, you know, with any level of certainty where we might go in that, in that period. So they're just an indication. Uh, okay. And then the last slide that we've got is about the next steps. So we're coming to you today for um, to get approval on the draft to take it out to consultation. Um, we also have a suggestion, a, a recommendation about um, getting delegated authority for minor changes in the interim before we go out to consultation. We have, to, we have to do a special consultation um, process. It 
We're suggesting that it's four weeks from early June. Um, we will, as part of that consultation, uh, have information on the website. Uh, we've got advertisements uh, in newspapers and media um, suggestions coming through. We also have targeted consultation with stakeholders and some uh, drop-in sessions. We've got, um, we've, we are undertaking um, uh, work with community partners so that we can try and reach hard to uh, reach communities, for instance, Māori and Pacifica. And as Claire suggested, we also have ongoing work with uh, hapu and iwi groups in that uh, consultation period. Um, this fits into our overall um, timeline to try and get to committee uh, in December with, an, uh, with, a, uh, with a document for adoption. So, Not December. Did I say December? You said December. I, that was a slip of the tongue. It, it's September that we're, that we're going out for. So public consultation in June, looking at local board feedback in July, adoption in September. And that timeline is really so that we can inform that um, strategic direction in the LTP, which, as you know, that process really needs that information ahead of its adoption in uh, 2024 June. Thank you. So that's the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, fulsome presentation on a really uh, complex but an, a significant document um, and change going forward. Right, I've got five questions. Councillor Fletcher. Oh, thank you. And thank you for explaining that, you know, where we are looking at this in detail in terms of changes to the 2018 development strategy and you're seeking our approval on this document to go out for consultation and you're saying that that is going to ideally take place in June. Um, I guess where I'm coming from with my questions and is that in going out for consultation, the assumption from the public will be that we broadly approve the strategic direction on what are going to be wide-ranging impacts. Some of these will be controversial, but that we have had all the information. A difficulty that I've got today is that there's no reference in, in the report that we've got on, if you're looking at Plan Change 78, on the pause that we have made in terms of the infrastructure review that we're seeking and the year's delay um, on some of the natural hazards and the, the very good work that the Chair and Councillor Dalton in terms of the response that we've had from the Minister. There's not a detail of, or breakdown, there's, there's just assumptions that it's continuing business as usual. Now, I know that you're trying to work to the LTP, but in going up for consultation, I do not want to be misleading anybody. I want to know and be able to put my hand on my heart, I have all the information. And I don't have all the information, so I just would like your response to that. I'm going to take my time to think about the answer because that's a really important point you're raising. Um, I think what the FDS does is that it actually responds to um, a lot of what you are raising, particularly let's focus on the natural hazards. So it responds to that um, in many different ways. And what the FDS does is in um, a number of future urban areas, it actually recommends that where there are significant natural hazard constraints, that that land um, be looked at for downzoning, not for urban development, um, because of the obvious reasons. Within the existing urban area, it also helps you in the sense that it identifies a number of locations across the region where there are multiple um, hazards that overlap. Um, it identifies those areas and it then recommends that um, those become the areas 
where you focus your um, future adaptive planning. So it absolutely recognizes um, those hazards and that it is potentially not appropriate to continue with development as normal in those areas and it sets that process up for you by identifying that and recommending that that is where you um, start that adaptive planning. Whatever the, so the FDS does not get to the point where it says what the result of that adaptive planning is. Um, uh, because, uh, if you could pull the mic closer oh, to sorry. you, just, you're just a bit quiet. Because in each um, area and each community is quite different and, and, and what the um, ultimate best uh, way forward is, that varies, so it does not say what the result of that is, but it sets that process in chain that you can actually do all of those things that you are wanting to do. In terms of um, contestable policy advice coming to us um, as decision makers, was there any interdepartmental um, discussion around the fact that there isn't yet additional information? You know, when you're considering Plan Change 78 and the pause and, you know, if, if you just think back to the discussion we had around the last agenda item, um, the world has changed. And while we're on... Um, a sequenced pathway, have we been sufficiently cognizant of the changes or are we just so hell-bent on getting towards the LTP that we're just ignoring stuff? I suppose the, um, in, uh, the information that the FDS is um, based on, so, so I'm focusing on hazards again. And there, of course, are other elements as well. Um, that information and, um, is the same information that will be used for the Plan Change 78 review. Um, so we are working off the same information. Um, what the FDS, um, so the rest of the organisation and the CCOs, um, all involved in this, and um, that's where the information and the expertise come from in terms of hazards and flooding and that kind of thing. Um, and like I say, this, this really sets the council up for the path that it wants to go down, um, recognising that there are constraints um, and that some of these things uh, most likely will have to be thought through again um, and the result um, of that process might be quite different. Um, so yes, I think the FTS absolutely recognises that the world has changed tremendously and it's going to keep on changing. Um, there's a whole section in the document that actually talks about that and all that uncertainty that comes with it. So I think it does address that um, and, it, and it really sets the council up for, for the processes over the next number of years um, in, in achieving all of that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether, in terms of your question, Councillor Fetcher, whether you're also referring to the capacity issue or... May not be. Okay. No, I'm, and and I'm not wishing to be in any way disrespectful, but I am not persuaded that I have all the information I need on such a, an important and potentially controversial and wide-ranging change that I could put my hand on my heart and say I I have all the information I know I need today. You know, we have so many workshops for so many things in this place. We spend all our time meeting here. And yet on something so substantial that will alter the face of our city in the future, we've actually had very little visibility on this. And I, I, it's just leaving me feeling uncomfortable. Can you, can you s confirm to me that you believe you have given adequate information on this for councillors and members of the IMSB to make decisions today? Um, I, I can answer that slightly differently. Um, uh, whether, whether you feel that we have given sufficient information, I mean, that's, that's your 
for you to make that call. If you ask me, am I confident that what um, the information that the proposed FTS is based on, am I confident that we have sufficient information um, to make the recommendations that we do? Yes, I do. We, we also did have three workshops on specifically on this and did ask for as much questions to come from members on, on any advice they didn't think they were getting at the time. So I guess it's a, it's a balance of... So through you, Mr Chair, um, w those workshops, I might be wrong, but were they before or after the request we made for a delay with Plan Change uh, 78? They were after. So they were February 22nd, March 22nd, and the 5th of April. So what date did we get the response confirming um, the year's delay? Before the, before the March one. So we've had two since, but I think the advice I've, because uh, I had had another member ask about the relationship with Plan Change 78, but it is um, considered, but it's not the same. And the, the, I guess my political view is that what this future development strategy does is finally include adaptation, climate mitigation, significant focus on hazards that we haven't been able to have before. So we are moving significantly more towards the area you're speaking of and what we're going to be trying to do through the Plan Change 78 changes. But we're also required to do this work <coughs> and we're required to do it for the LTP as well. So it's trying to do it concurrently but connected at the same time. I guess, John, did you have a view? Well, I'm certainly aware that there have been several workshops on the future development strategy, but in terms of the pause on Plan Change 78, um, that's going to allow Council time to investigate the impacts of the flooding, the severe weather events, and have a response in terms of the entry plan. But the entry plan sits at a far more detailed property by property level than the future development strategy, which is, has, has maps about future future land use, but they are at a very high level, the unitary plan is a much more detailed level, that there's nothing that I'm seeing in the draft future development strategy that would be out of sync with you know, any possibility of where Plan Gen 78 might go. It's quite a, different, um, quite a different document in terms of the precision, the detail that has to sit within a unitary plan versus a 30-year strategy in the future development strategy. And as Jacques has mentioned, there are all sorts of, um, there's a lot of content around natural hazards and how that should be dealt with going forward. So, I don't want to delay other councillors and members of the IMS be having questions and I'll come back. Thank you, councillor. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Chair. Um, am I correct that the draft FDS essentially stops any development in rural areas, whether it be residential, commercial or industrial, even if it meets FDS in all other areas? Um, Councillor Simpson, that's not... No, I would not use that language. The FDS does not stop development or... Um, that is a resource management process, so that's a, a unitary plan RM process. What the FDS does is it sets the direction um, for growth and development over 30 years. Um, but in itself, it does not stop development, no. Okay, so I'm now going to come across um, Council Fletcher's question in a different way. So we have a pause in Plan Change 78, right? Due to stormwater, natural hazards, concerns and weather events, etc. The inevitable consequence of this review will be less intensification in existing residential locations. Why are we not halting this until the outcome of Plan Change 78 to know whether we should expand in other areas or not? Because I, I actually see exactly what you're trying to say. I'm just trying to put it a different way. I guess, yeah, I guess those questions have, I guess those questions were already answered, but we could get Jacques to... Um, my, my thing is, we're concentrating on the urban areas, right? Now, we know, well, we don't know, but we, we and you never assume, but as a result of the flooding, etc., we know that that, will be, that won't be as much as we had initially expected, right? 
Surely you get the outcome of that, and then you figure out, right, well, if you've got to have minimised areas here, 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 you could look for more over there, 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 there. So I'm still of the opinion that we should wait for Plan Change 78 review to occur, and I don't, I just can't get that simple question of why. That, that was just answered, but we could get it repeated. No, oh, no, I, I'm... I'm really happy to answer that. Um, Councillor Sumsum, some, um, so, the, so the, yes, the plan change 78 um, result, let us, let's assume, um, means that it may reduce, change the zoning and reduce capacity in certain areas, absolutely. Um, but you have to keep in mind that um, at the moment, um, there's over 2.3 million capacity what you need, roughly speaking, is an additional 200,000. Um, so, so as it is, there is way more um, capacity than what you could possibly e ever need. Um, even if you think about the existing unity plan, forget plan chain 78, you have about a million capacity anyway. So. The, the, the chances that plan change 78 is going to make a material difference in terms of the capacity is, is not that great. Also remember um, what the FTS um, does is if you create capacity elsewhere, what the FTS it does is it gives you direction about where best to create that capacity. It does not deal with zoning or, you know, it doesn't zone anything, but it, but it, it, it directs where that additional capacity, um, if it's needed, where that should ideally be created. Clearly it's not in an area um, that's gonna have hazard um, constraints. What the, what the FDS also says, um, one of its uh, recommendations, is where we forego capacity, for example, through Plan Change 78, then we must, over time, create additional capacity in those good areas so that the, we broadly maintain the capacity. So that's what the FDS does say. Gotcha. And just my last question, if I may. So often when we go up for consultation, it is maybe, and I'm just looking at the um, budget, for example, a lot of us voted for the budget even though we weren't 100% sure that that was the right thing to do. Are you saying in this case, it's going out for consultation and by supporting that um, document, we are saying this is the right thing, this is what we think is the right thing to do. Do you agree with us? Um, I, I, I suppose uh, the first part of that answer is what the, what the FDS is, is council's approach, its strategy, um, in terms of growth over 30 years. It's not a here now. Um, but what it does do is um, it then informs the long-term plan. Um, in terms of the infrastructure investment that will be needed um, for this growth, the FDS does not make that decision. That is a long-term plan decision. It merely informs that discussion in terms of the long-term plan. Um, but if you broadly, um, yes, we are, uh, what the FDS says is this is council's approach based on lots of considerations, based on lots of information, and looking at the region as a whole, this is how we believe the best for way forward, given all those considerations, um, the best way forward for growing over the next 30 years. You will also um, have seen there's um, the, the issue of infrastructure funding. How we pay for all of the infrastructure is dealt with significantly in the um, FDS, and that is a real consideration um, and plays out in much of what the FDS, in terms of the timing, because there's a real issue, and it is trying to help council um, in terms of that, the costs that come with us. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sayers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Richard, I've got quite a few questions. Sorry, I've got about 10 of them. They shouldn't take too long to answer, but I do have a list, list of them. Um, uh, 
and I, you know, I do reserve my right to speak in case I don't quite. I will, I will make more questions, Yark. But um, um, I'm, I'm just. I, I'm basically these, these questions are in my head because I have a number of reservations at this stage. Um, but I'm sure you know that the questions might be able to help me there, Yark, in terms of the, in terms of the completeness, depth of the paper, and because there are accumulative effects that can occur in actions, including this very paper, that could impact housing affordability for Auckland and, you know, uh, and just the um, supply of land, right? So, so my first question, I understand we've had three workshops, Chair, uh, in terms of the input from the local boards, I just want to get a feel, have they had, has there been the opportunity for them to feed into this paper to date? Question one. Through the chair, um, we have engaged with local boards in the briefing, in briefings, um, but their request was to come back to them for more thorough engagement once the consultation feedback had come in, so that they can see what people in their local areas are saying. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you for that answer. So and maybe to, just to add to that, the um, the local boards, of course, were also part of the workshops. The chairs, the chairs, the chairs, yeah. yeah, okay. The, in terms of potentially, if, the, if we didn't make a decision today, Jacques, and, and we re, like I've got no, I'm not against the paper going up for consultation uh, in, in any way, and all the objectives that it's trying to achieve, I don't really have a problem, problem with. Um, but for, to gain that degree of um, uh, confidence that uh, Councillor Fletcher also kind of alluded to that was, a, was irking her at the moment. What what timeline opportunities have we got for potentially working up the paper a little bit further, if need be? Uh, are we under any time constraints? Uh, the, the the time constraint really is the um, the legislation requiring the FDS to inform the long term plan. <clears throat> so um, just kind of working backwards. Uh, generally, how it works is December you more or less land that draft long term, so December this year, you will land the draft um, long-term plan budget, and then it, of course, goes out to consultation, say, in March um, in the following year. So working back from December, um, what needs to happen is, say, things like asset management plans need to take the funding direction for consideration, it needs to be built into asset management plans. So all of that works and work needs to be done so that it can inform the draft budget, the long-term plan budget. So um, we're already stretching it a bit, um, looking at September. Um, so that is the timeline that, yeah. Okay, Jacques, thank you. Um, in terms of, we talked about the, or you, you presented to us and it's in the paper about the uh, in terms of the consultation process, we're going to target certain audiences there. Uh, I made a list of them here. Um, uh, obviously, Māori and Pacifica, key stakeholders and community partners. Uh, I'm just wanting to gain some confidence about what input developers and what input planners in the industry uh, to make sure that they are targeted. Uh, have we doing any specific targeting to them or just perhaps relying on them because it's a consultative process, they'll just participate anyway? Are we targeting them specifically in any way or do we? Uh, through the Chair, yes, we do. We have done some consultation, obviously, with um, the Property Council before this draft was uh, done. Uh, we're also going to go out to stakeholders within the community and, and including... Um, you know, professional bodies, etc., uh, that are in um, in that development field. We're also, obviously, um, as part of our in-house work, we've looked at what's happening in the development field across Auckland. So the answer is yes to, um, in terms of specific consultation, uh, both before and after. Um, Consultation. Um, thank you. Um, the supporting assessments and uh, uh, could just could just um, explain to me what are the what are those supporting assessments and particularly perhaps 
or what are what, what ones are included and I'm probably I'm specifically interested in perhaps around the economic assessment to support the paper I couldn't find I couldn't find much in there Sorry, Councillor um, Sayers, um, supporting assessments. Can you just direct me a bit more? Yeah, I guess, you know, what's uh, in terms of putting some economic uh, drivers around the paper? About having a strategy or about? Uh, I, I, I guess, Richard, in terms of I'm concerned about, if, uh, perhaps if I could lead on to my next question, because it might help. So my next question was around, does this replace, uh, I think you touched on it, Jack, but I might have missed it, the Auckland plan and the future, the current future urban land supply strategies, does this replace those documents? It does, okay. So it's really just understand that, and, you know, if we go forward with this and we um, perhaps get a not get landed in the same places where those documents are, are there the economic uh, benefits of the paper compared to where we sit now to what's being proposed? Uh, has any work been done on it, Jacques? Yes, I guess you will know if that helps. Yeah, so um, you are correct. <clears throat> if the once, once, if we consult on this and um, once you adopt a final FDS, um, it will replace the future urban land supply strategy in the sense that it now incorporates it into the FDS rather than being a separate thing. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the um, it, through RMA processes, um, the, uh, any so a hearing on a private plan change then needs to take into account the FDS and it's all in one place rather than a separate document with a false. Um, so yeah, it, it replaces that. In terms of, in terms, so there's an evidence report um, that of course sits behind this, but in terms of um, the economic aspect of that, uh, translating that, so, so the practical way that we can do that is to look at capacity. That's where the capacity comes in. And as I say um, at the moment, um, there's capacity of over 2.3 million. Um, there's a demand for around 200,000, and so there's a vast difference between the capacity um, required and, and, and what we have. Um, but, um, as speakers have pointed out, um, some of that capacity may be taken away because of issues such as the flooding um, and a different zoning that might happen there. Um, but there is still um, a vast amount of capacity available. So thank you for that, Zarek. It probably leads on to my next question quite nicely in terms of the... Uh, regard, so regardless of capacity, is there... Could there uh, I guess one of my fears is that it could slow down development rather than... Rather from its, yeah, I guess that's my, that's my concern. So is there potential that it could slow down development? I, um, I would struggle uh, to explain how it would slow down development in that sense. Um, where that kind of assessment and looking at the market, so, so there are so many things related to how um, the development sector might respond. The FDS, um, the FDS is based, um, part of it is based on the housing and business capacity work that we also have to do through. And it is that document, that process, that looks at the economic side of things, it looks at how the market is and is not responding, it looks at development economics, um, it looks at trends, um, all kinds of things. And it then assesses whether based on all of those things, there is sufficient capacity, whether there is sufficient feasible capacity, so that's a subset of capacity, it does all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it is that then feeds into the FDS. Um, and so it is that information that has informed this FDS. And it um, assesses that there is sufficient capacity um, and therefore should not hold up and slow down development um, in that sense because there's 
the capacity available. Okay, thanks, Jack. Yeah, that kind of, that, yeah, I did have that question in my head around um, certainty, you know, for development and people wanting to move forward. So just two more, Richard. Uh, the the um, just just looking at some sections there pertaining to Walkworth, um, obviously, and I'm familiar with that being within my ward. I can identify some outdated information that's that's been used there, and uh, that concerns me that they could be perhaps a bit wider spread. Shark in terms of you know being a so if you've got any comment around the uh, the freshness of the data or um, not the accuracy but just how um, relevant it might be in terms of <laughs> advancements that's uh, you know I know in Walkworth there's been a lot of development and sequencing of infrastructure rolling out there as we speak so just your confidence around the paper and this. and then just one more. Uh, thank you. So we've been talking with uh, all the infrastructure um, teams, so within council and also Waka Kotahi, who, um, you know, that's integral, they're integral in terms of um, funding of um, transport projects. Um, so we've been talking to them right up to, to this point to get the draft done. It's been a massive exercise in terms of getting all that information together, and it's always a, a changing playing field. Um, so if there is anything specific that um, you feel you know, is outdated or not quite, then we'd be very interested in hearing about that, particularly before it goes out for consultation. But, but from, our, from our understanding, we did have the the correct data as of probably um, a week ago. A, a week ago. <laughs> yes. Thank you. That. Thank you. Because um, I just so just my last question was around who you have engaged with in terms of the CCOs and elsewhere. So you've met. You mentioned Waka Kotahi. So can we just tick off that that has included input from Water Care and also the Supporting Growth Alliance? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes, I have met Supporting Growth. Um, we've also and. And you know that's a big project in its own right. Um, we've talked, we've talked to, uh, and got information from Water Care. Healthy Waters has also been um, on that list. We've talked with um, Transport. Auckland Transport and also um, Ekipanuku. Plus, um, we've talked with um, Auckland Unlimited as well, Tataki. Very good. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for your answers. Um, thank you for your indulgence, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just reminding everyone that uh, Councillor Williamson and Member Henare and others have asked for a, a quick meeting, and there is a lot of questions that um, we did go over quite in detail during the workshop, so we just need to keep um, that in mind. Uh, Councillor Baker. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Councillor Felicia, for asking some of the questions I was going to ask in regards to the relationship to PC78 and stuff. Um, Jacques, how does this plan address, I guess, those that talks a little bit rural, um, in the rural section, it talks about rural settlements and sort of um, talks about Pukekohe and Walkworth um, as examples. How does it address the rural settlements that are urban? And so Beachlands is the settlement that comes to mind. It's doubled in size. It's now 12,000 people. Um, and how does this, because there's two pages on rural, and it basically slams the door on anything that sits outside. And anyone that sat through the unitary plan and rural urban boundary discussions will recall that we deliberately left out places like Waiuku um, and places like uh, Beachlands um, from creating future urban zones in the rural urban boundary around that to allow development to happen in a, to allow development to happen in an appropriate manner. Um, as a case-by-case -case basis almost. And what this does, in my view, is, is slam the door on that. So how have you factored in development in rural settlements that are, in fact, urban settlements but remote? And, you know, and, and if we are to achieve the things that the Chair talks about in climate mitigation and ad adaptation, um, that only comes from scale. So how does that addressed? Because I don't see it. Councillor Baker, um, 
I suppose at the at the broadest level, um, the direction is really that we should not have a great deal of development in um, areas that are far flung, um, given given the emissions uh, issue that needs to be dealt with, um, and and the broad concept is that the bulk of development should be within the existing urban area. So that's probably the starting point. But in terms of those existing uh, uh, rural settlements, um, a number of them, of course, do have future urban land associated with them, Clark's Beach, Maritai, Glenbrook, and those. So they've actually got future urban land, um, and, so they, and so there is capacity for development um, still um, associated with many of those um, smaller settlements in the rural areas. Of course, the, the, um, the, the model, let's say, um, of the compact um, approach is that we also have those two um, rural nodes of Pukekohe and, and Walkworth as the main focus for, for growth in the rural areas. But I, so um, you've got those two nodes. But as I say, in terms of many of the settlements, those rural settlements, they do actually have existing future, existing, they have future urban land associated with them. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, and so there is capacity for growth in those settlements um, through that provision. So, Mr Chair, so, so again, not talking about the areas that have got future urban, I'm talking about the areas where previous planning decisions have been made that have created these remote urban settlements. How do we, and that the issues there, can own, and so the climatic, the social, the environmental issues that have been created by the planning decisions of the past, which have created these remote areas, that do contribute intensely because people do have to travel, because we've created these dormitories. And so how does this do anything? And so I'm not, again, clear, not talking about the areas that have got future urban and have got, um, and, you know, lives, or, you know, the, the um, nice little mustardy coloured areas in the maps. I am talking about the areas that we've previously been allowed to develop and have created these remote things. How do we deal with that? Because the only way we mitigate those issues, the climate, the environment, um, the, all of the things, is by actually allowing growth to create scale. It's quite a perverse sort of situation, but it allows for industry and commercial and jobs and people to live and work as opposed to just sleeping and driving. And so how can we, through this, actually reflect that not all parts of Auckland are massively urban within the nice little urban, the old mull, if you like. How do we reflect that and how do we enable through this for actually better outcomes than we currently have from planning decisions of the past? Because again, I don't see it and I see this as actually stopping that and so that we create worse outcomes in terms of environmental. The, <clears throat> the approach that the FTS takes um, is uh, it, does, it is not proposing any further uh, future urban growth in those settlements that don't have any uh, future urban land. Um, and I suppose the basis of that is um, for a settlement like that to become sustainable through commerce and employment and um, all of the things that go with that, those need to become major settlements. Um, by adding 100 dwellings um, does not make a sustainable village. So I suppose where we've come from is rather than uh, continue with adding little bits of um, um, development capacity around settlements that are really not sustainable. Um, the only solution to make them sustainable is massive development um, that has to be funded through infrastructure. 
we already have significant infrastructure constraints. So the FTS um, does not do that. It takes a different approach. It's it, it kind of, and that approach is that we should not continue to um, expand uh, small rural settlements with further urban development that then requires additional infrastructure. Um, it's not on that, down that route. It has said, let's keep them as they are. Um, the solution is not to keep on adding bits of urban um, because to make that sustainable means you will have to add significant urban expansion, um, which has to be funded for which there probably is not funding. And the other things that come with that. I just reserve my right to uh, speak later. <laughs> All good. Councillor Foley. Kia ora, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to start by thanking you, Jacques, uh, Dawn and Claire, for your comprehensive report and also the workshops, which were very comprehensive um, and where we did all the councillors around the table as well as the local boards were able to ask many questions and many questions were asked and we responded to those um, across time. And um, I appreciate also that you listened to many of our concerns following the flood events and the weather events. Um, and responded in the way that you modified the report and modified some of the areas. I remember the, you know, the maps that were put up and you showed us where we pulled back from some of the areas where there was you know, potential for flood and other hazards, but as a result of you know, where we are now as a city and our past experience, that's been modified. And still, um, still even taking, having lessened that area for capacity, we still have the capacity for 2.3 million um, homes. And so I really appreciate um, that very fulsome um, opportunity to engage in this document. I appreciate also the legis legislative timeline and the constraints that that creates for us all here as well. And so my question is actually about the draft that's before us. Um, I'm mindful it's 121 pages very text heavy. There are some nice pictures in there, but it is very text heavy. So when you take it out for engagement in June, and I'm also mindful, June is when we will also be, you know, talking about the budget and everyone will be focused on that. Um, and there is probably consultation fatigue in our community at the moment. Um, traditionally, we have low feedback from young people, from people of Māori, Pacifica, ethnic communities. So all of those things I'm very mindful of. Um, and you did say that you are going to engage in community partners. So um, if you could just elaborate a little bit more of your plan of how you're going to take that out for consultation, whether you're going, you know, how are you going to present this in such a way that it's not just 121 pages of lots and lots of text, Will you have infographics? Will you break it down? I would be interested to hear um, what that plan is. And community groups, how you're going to identify the community groups or navigators that will help you to engage with our communities. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Fully. We will share that answer. Um, the first bit that I will speak to is um, if the... Um, if the draft is adopted for consultation, what we will do is um, prepare a summary document. So much more accessible, it will have all the key things, um, but a much more accessible document that will also be translated. Um, so that's the first step. In terms of, um, and I will hand over to Claire to talk about the community partners. Um, the community partners <coughs> is something that the engagement team have been working on and with for um, a few engagements now, I think. Um, they are key people in the community that um, represent some of the diverse communities we have in Tamaki Makoto. So they've got particular people in um, Chinese, Pacifica, youth, disability, ethnic communities, and they work closely with people in those communities to distribute information to the community. Sometimes they um, invite staff along and sometimes they distribute it through their networks using their own techniques. So we're still working with the contacts to figure out um, which of those partners are interested in picking up the future development strategy and working with their communities um, and what our role would be in that. Um, but as Jacques said, 
the summary document would be translated into um, a number of different languages. In terms of um, Auckland Māori and Mātawaka, um, I spoke a little bit in the presentation about what we're doing, the work that we're doing with iwi and mana whenua around the values and aspirations statement. Um, for Mātawaka, we're also working through exactly um, planning that approach, but uh, we're looking at working with um, some particular organisations, um, Te Kotahi o Tamaki, the Marae Collective, um, the Urban, the Manako Urban Māori Authority, and um, Te Fano o Te Waipareira. So a few of those different organisations, um, the Rangatahi Networks, um, the Māori Women's Welfare League. We've got a number of different um, organisations and um, contacts within those organisations that we're looking to approach. Um, also, there are some Māori research organisations and academics that we're also in touch with. Kia ora. Thank you for that. And can I encourage you to reach out to the local board strategic brokers um, in my ward because they can probably help you to connect um, with some of those uh, community navigators as well um, to better engage with our communities. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Kia ora. <coughs> um, uh, Councillor Walker. I've got a few um, questions. Um, in, the, in the plan, plan. you've got the, got the something going on. Something going on. I've turned it on. Not on my level. Councillor Stewart, you have your mic on. Your mic on. Your mic on. Okay. We good to go? We are. Okay. Um, so in the. Um, in the document, you've got areas subject to further investigation. What does that mean? Uh, it, uh, I may have missed it in terms of what's indicated. Is, sorry, can I just um, check, Councillor Walker? Is that in the, fut the future urban area map? Yeah, I'm looking at the maps, um, for example, off the top of my head, there are areas of Dairy Flat that are subject to further investigation. There's area in Drury that are subject to further investigation. I'm making the assumption, because I know those locations, that one of the imperatives is the flooding hazard in those areas. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So <clears throat> four areas I identified that we are really confident that there are major hazard issues. Um, and so the recommendation is that those areas um, be looked at for uh, removing for urban development. The ones you are referring to are additional areas that we've identified where there certainly are um, issues in terms of hazards. It needs a bit more further investigation to, to, to confirm um, outside of the FDS whether those areas okay. are appropriate okay. for. And I note that um, one of those areas is the area in Riverhead that we were just discussing. So it is identified as further investigation. That includes the whole of the area that we were discussing for that uh, proposed uh, plan change. So I'm assuming that there are some good reasons for that further investigation. Yeah, they um, again mainly relate to uh, water. Okay, uh, the reason I mention that is because of the disconnect between one agenda item and another, Mr Chair. Um, the other um, um, question I've got um, just goes to the supporting information for the areas that are blacked out. So they are the areas that you're putting up that um, are taken out. Um, so, for example, you've got an area in Kumi Huapai. I'm assuming that corresponds to flooding. There's the area that we identified in Riverhead that's identified for flooding, plus the area um, larger than that, Takanini, uh, areas of Drury, um, Hatfields. 
Is there supporting information around those black areas in terms of the reasoning behind it? Uh, and is that available? Through the chair, yes. Yes, we have supporting information. So assessments have been done around um, all, the, all the areas, the future urban right? all the future urban areas, and um, that information will be available um, during the consultation period. So that's going out with this. Ha have we seen that information ourselves? Um, you've, we, we looked at, as part of the workshops, information and, you know, in the broad sense about each of those future urban areas, particularly about things like um, constraints, um, natural constraints. So we had maps that were um, shown to the committee about each of those areas. The ones that are suggested for uh, removal are Hatfield Beach. There's um, the flooding area around the the, sure. um, the river at um, Kumiu. There's um, uh, Takanini. Sure, got that. Is, got that. So I, I understand that. So that yeah. that's good. So, um, the, the other question that I ask, uh, Mr Chair, and, and I, I don't have any um, issue with those areas that are identified in black, um, given that our state at this point in time is on a continuum, and by that I mean um, sea level rise is, is occurring on a non-linear basis, so there are going to be areas that we are not identifying now as hazards that are going to be flooded in the future. And that is, that is an absolute certainty, so we know that. It's simply a function of time, and that process is accelerating. Are we going to be communicating that sort of information to people so that they've got an appreciation that this is a point in time now, but it's going to be exacerbating because we might identify an area that's, you know, an RL data above um, sea level at this point, but it's going to, that area is going to expand and that expansion may only take another 10, 20, 30 um, centimetres. Are we communicating that sort of information so that people understand that this is the circumstance now but it's going to be changed and there's a near certainty around that? Councillor Walker, there are probably two parts uh, to that answer. <clears throat> the one is through those areas that we've identified for further investigation. That has to be part of that investigation. We can't just look at what things are like today. We have to look at what they might be like um, 30 years into the future. So that's one part of the answer. In, uh, and so um, through that process, of course, there will be communication around that. But generally speaking around what you are mentioning, um, the F it's probably not the purpose of the FDS um, to be the vehicle um, at the moment for communicating that with communities. It certainly has to be done, um, but there probably are other processes through which we, um, that broader understanding of what is coming, um, sea level rise, how things are going to be different in the future, um, we probably have other avenues through which we uh, have to do that. It's, do we provide any links in what we're going out with to those other um, studies or the like, so that oh, people we, are in a position to hmm. access it? Is that um, possible? Probably in the in the evidence that sits behind it, but we Got can that. make sure that that happens. Okay, yeah, I understand that. And, and my last question, off the top of my head, I think you mentioned the 2.35 million or something like that as the um, future uh, projection, and that's based around the... NPSUD and the MDRS and, and the like, I'm assuming. I thought that the, that, the, that the figure was actually more than that in total. Am I mistaken? Uh, I have it as the 2.3. Yeah. Okay. If we can check that, that'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I've got two, last two questions and then we'll, we will go... Um, have a break, staff especially need to have lunch. Um, Member Ashby. Kia ora. Thank you, and um, thanks again for your uh, continued work on this. Um, I just have one question, because um, Councillor uh, Fooley's already 
asked one of them, but uh, the, the question I have really is around um, the, the current um, framing of this uh, in terms of um, Māori economic development. So this is something I've hit on in the past. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you've acknowledged in your draft documents that have gone out uh, around the inequities of um, treaty settlement and other Māori land that tends to be rural and tends to be coastal by virtue of, uh, by virtue of all the other land was nicked and developed. And so um, th there's an inequity there that's also acknowledged and referenced as a matter of significance in the unitary plan currently and the, and the RPS objectives. And that's around the, um, they're quite directive, um, don't worry, there is a question. Uh, they're quite d directive um, provisions in terms of um, uh, enabling that economic uh, development as a, as a key pillar of well-being of um, iwi and Māori communities. So um, I, I'm just, I know it's sort of in there, in the mix, in the DNA of what you've done, but um, is there a way that you can make that Bearing in mind, this is you're going into a four-week consultation uh, window with uh, iwi and Māori with a potential 30-year consequence. Is there a way that you can make that even more explicit? Um, I.e., is there potentially an avenue for um, spatialising that or mapping that into what you've done, rather than just sort of having it as a sort of value buried in the background? So, we can look at it and see what we can come up with. We can also weave more of that into the business section as well. So it's not just in the, you know, the section about culture, and it's also um, through those other sections. We've tried wherever we can to actually weave the Māori um, story through the document, but, but there are still some areas we could okay. look at. <coughs> We can look at it and talk yeah, about no, it. Yeah, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and um, uh, I, I can totally appreciate that it is in there weaved. Um, I just think we need to elevate the uh, economic well-being for Māori up as well as the, um, the focus on kaitiakitanga in terms of the environment, which is important, but it's also the uplifting of the well-being of, um, of, of our people. So thank you. Kia ora. thank you, Member Ashby. Last question, uh, Councillor Henderson. Gosh, I'm last. Goodness, sorry, everybody. Um, just very quickly, because I know we've done a huge amount of work on this and we've done plenty of workshops already coming to this table. I just want to first acknowledge you guys for all your hard work, so thank you very much for that. Uh, it can be a thankless task, so thank you. Um, just one question. Um, there's these excellent maps here on Nexus which show that the areas most hazardous to development are the south and west of Auckland, aka the areas that have taken on the most growth for 12 years. When can we release these to the public? Are they available? Can I spread it to the world? Uh, Councillor Anderson, um, they probably are public right now. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yep. Wonderful, awesome, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, I will, I'll move and Councillor uh, Dalton, Deputy Chair of this committee, would like to second. We will move for um, half an hour lunch. Thank you to the staff for all your work on this and for all the um, workshops and information. And also reminding everyone, the direction for this was passed unanimously too by the, the committee with everything put in there to make you do the, the draft. So just want to say thank you for, for that. Mr um, Chairman, sorry, before you break, I really do want to get a, a point away here. Councillor Walker had a problem before, so have I. When you looked at what was up there from the Nexus demonstration, there were a couple of maps. The moment you tried to zoom, they were so pixelated, they were completely unreadable. You then said, well, we were sent a PDF. I went back and I looked, and from Duncan Glasgow a week ago, we got a PDF, 60-page PDF, which bore no resemblance to the document, I did find on page 54, finally down the very bottom, probably unlike most of the councillors, I didn't read all 60 pages of that attached PDF. I'm sure the rest did. But I didn't know that map. Here's a map on that PDF that you can zoom right down to the suburb 
and see the wording and where it is. But on Nexus, you can't even begin to zip drill in or it just becomes a pixelated piece of junk. And I just don't know why we have a system where councillors cannot see documents of equality that we can then finally get a, a PDF sent to us if we're lucky and told it's page 54 buried down the bottom. So there's the one off the PDF we got sent, very readable, incredibly readable, but not the one that's on Nexus. And unfortunately, Nexus is now down, and I can't get on. I don't know whether Councillor Turner can on. Oh, you're back on there. <coughs> Thank you. The, um, Sandra also sent it. Out. So that I asked, and we asked because of your feedback for everything to be sent in PDF. It was a week ago. Not that document we Hold were on. watching there with Hold two on, maps please. on it. Hold on, please. And then we've sent all the maps out on Monday. Sandra sent them out again to all of us um, with the PDFs again so everyone could see. It says copy of maps only and it shows all the easily. So, I mean, I guess it's not my job to, to point which email. I don't have time to but maybe next time I will. But why does Nexus not have a PDF of equality that it's you can look at it? It probably is... What? But I, guess, I guess the issue is that is a, probably a very expensive program to get it to the level we want, and everyone's asking for spending cuts all the time. So um, No, 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 it's nothing to do with spending cuts. It's just the quality it's they post the PDF yeah. to. Sorry. Nexus. <laughs> so, but can I just say... No, I will say, because this happens every time, the PDFs were sent out to everyone twice to look at. So, I mean, I don't know what else I can do here. It doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. And I am not. Yes, I have asked, but it is a very expensive way to upgrade the system that we don't have budget for. So, thank you. We're going to lunch half an hour.